Uh, Ephesians 4, 17 to 32. Therefore I say this and testify in the Lord. You should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their thoughts. They're darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. They became callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. But that's not how you learned about the Messiah, assuming you heard him and were taught by him because the truth is in Jesus. You took off your former way of life, the old man that is corrupted by deceitful desires. You're being renewed in the spirit of your minds. You put on the new man, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of truth. Since you put away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbour, because we're members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. The thief must no longer steal. Instead, he must do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. No rotten talk should come from your mouth, but only what is good for the building up of someone in need in order to give grace to those who hear. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit who sealed you for the day of redemption. All bitterness, anger and wrath, insult and slander must be removed from you along with all wickedness and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, there's a sermon outline inside your service, uh, news sheets, and there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions at the end. But I want to continue with the date theme, and I want to ask you, don't you love those questions? Do you remember what you were doing on? So let me give you a date. September 14, 2015. Yeah, it's a struggle, isn't it? It's hard to remember what we had for breakfast. September 14, 2015. What happened on that day? Neil, you can't answer. The coup. Yeah, you can answer because you looked at the sermon beforehand, didn't you, Warwick? Yeah, there was a coup. It was actually in Australian politics. And on that day, September 14, 2015, Malcolm Turnbull defeated Tony Abbott for the Liberal Party leadership, 54 to 44. Now, I know that because I love politics. I'm a bit of a political tragic. But it was actually the end of a fairly significant period in Australian politics. It was actually one of those moments where really both sides of politics looked the same, didn't they? Just get rid of the guys. Opinion polls are pretty poor. Uh, I don't know what you thought about those events uh, at the time. And at least personally, I thought Tony Abbott was treated pretty badly. Now, that's regardless of what you think about his policies. Uh, and I was thinking about it at the time and over the years since, and, and even as I was preparing this sermon, I, th I think it came down to this. Tony Abbott couldn't change the way he walked. Tony Abbott couldn't change the way. Now, we all know how Tony Abbott walks, don't we? He walks like a former boxer in front row forward, you know, swaggers into the room with his arms out because he, he knows he's kingpin. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm actually talking about the way Tony Abbott moved through life. Because that's often the way we use that verb, walking. You see, our walking style is unique. Each of us walk differently. Now, walking itself is pretty simple biomechanics, isn't it? One foot in front of the other. But how we walk reveals who we are. And sometimes our walk needs to change because who we are changes. Now, Tony Abbott was brilliant in opposition, wasn't he? He was like one of those English forwards last night. He just never gave up. Unbelievable. Persistent and dogged. Every time there was an error in the policies of the government, he picked it, he exposed it, and he was relentless in his pursuit. And his walk suited that style of politics. And when he won government in September 2013, it was the climax of his whole life, I suspect, it was the climax of a period of brilliant, perhaps not constructive, opposition. But then he had to change his walk, didn't he? Because now he wasn't the leader of the opposition. He was the Prime Minister of Australia. And that's a completely different walk. He changed addresses. He changed his identity. And the walk had to change too. But old habits die hard. And so when he came under pressure, what did he do? He went back to his old walk and it didn't work. 
Uh, Let me be very clear at this point. The way Tony walked, thankfully, didn't make him Prime Minister, did it? He was made Prime Minister by the grace of the Australian people. In their decision, they granted him a new identity and his walk had to change to reflect it, to reflect who he'd become. Now, the Christians in Ephesus faced a similar challenge. No, Malcolm Turnbull wasn't back then. But they faced other challenges, and they faced similar challenges in the way they walked, how they moved through life. God had finally done what he'd always promised. He'd created a people for himself. Those people there have been taken from corpses to alive, from enemies of God to sitting at God's dinner table. From outside God's household to inside God's household, from serving the kingdom of the ruler of the air to serving the one who rules the whole universe. One saviour, one salvation. And God did it all for him. God did it all for him. And so it couldn't be changed, it couldn't be moved, but they had to change their walk to reflect what God had given them. But as so often happens... Change is hard, isn't it? And so when the new pressures came in or the old pressures came in, what do you naturally do? Much easier to walk in the way you're comfortable with. So that's why this section is here. Paul is saying, don't go back. And we're going to look at that this morning. Let me pray and then we're going to dive into God's word. Dear God, thanks for your word. Uh, Even just mentioning Cranmer there, we're reminded that we sit at at least here in, in relatively tranquil times. Father, we will go from this meeting to enjoy morning tea together or maybe a drought barbecue or or lunch with friends and relax this afternoon. Father, your word needs to still be working in us. And so we pray by your spirit that you'll apply your word to our hearts and minds, that you will help us, enable us, convict us to walk reflecting what you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, my family, as I was growing up, always loved words. Uh, we love words now in our family. I mean, one of the daggy games that I like to play are, are, are word jokes, puns. Uh, sometimes they get a bit, a bit obscure, but words matter, don't they? Uh, in a culture where things need to be kept to a certain number of characters, we've lost that significance. Words matter. I suspect when you're sitting in a Roman jail, or at least under house arrest, words still matter, don't they? Oh, that's where Paul is. He's got limited resources. He's under house arrest because he's talking to people about Jesus. For him, words matter. You don't waste words, let alone papyrus, because that's limited too, isn't it? So when Paul writes here, writing to a group of people he hasn't seen for seven years, but whom he spent three years with in Ephesus, modern-day Turkey, a town of about a quarter of a million people, when he writes to them from jail, he doesn't waste a word. So when we see, therefore, at the start of verse 17, it's not a wasted word, it's not a gap filler. It's not a like. It's there for a reason. So when Paul puts therefore in, he wants us to cast our minds back. It's his way of summarising the first three chapters in one word. Therefore, because God has an eternal plan to make a mob for himself, to unlock the universe by Jesus, Because God has sent his son, this Jesus, to live as humans could never live, to die for humans, to rise, to show that he had taken God's judgment. Therefore, because God did this just because he loved people, because by trusting in what God has done, people like this group in Ephesus, people like us can go from dead to alive. Therefore, because in this group of people, God's mob, There are no man-made divisions. There's no racism, no class structure. There's just one group who are saved by one saviour from one life of rebellion. Because God is maturing this group, growing them and tightening them and strengthening them and developing them. Therefore, therefore I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their thoughts. He's already been very clear, hasn't he, about who the Ephesians were, rebels under the judgment of God because they wanted to be God instead of God. 
who walked through life knowing or realising finally that they were under the judgment of God, had been miraculously saved only because God loved them. He's reminded them of that and then he said, this is immovable, this reality, you've changed postcodes. So now you are so connected to Jesus that you are in him. Because of this, change your walk. Now, Phil picked up a really interesting idea with walking last week. It's very hard to walk standing still. That was the idea that Phil was talking about last week. And it's really interesting in this second part of Ephesians, Ephesians 4 through 6, that this walk happens continually. There are at least five instances of it. This is how you are to make your way through life. But we know the pressures of life, don't we? There are pressures in Ephesus. You walk out of church on a Sunday from that little house church you're meeting in and you look up on the hill and there's a temple to the goddess Diana. Uh, You know the pressure to actually take part in the town festivals that are connected there. In fact, do you know where the butcher's shop is in your town, Ephesus? It's up at that temple because the butcher's shop sells the meat that they served up as sacrifice. So every time you go there to get a steak for dinner, there's the pressure. In fact, when you pay for the steak, there's the other pressure, isn't there? Those coins in your pocket, whose image do they bear? Well, the Roman emperor, don't they? The one who really brought peace to the world. There's some more pressure. And in fact, as you go up to that temple and as you pay with those coins to buy the meat, you go past the Jewish synagogue, don't you? There's some more pressure. The Jews who are part of the mob, We know those pressures, don't we? We're the third generation in a certain small country town. People are at my baptism. My kids went to school with your kids. I did year 12 with you. I spent time with you in your 20s. We know the pressure of a small town. If it's not that pressure, it's the pressure of coming into a small town, isn't it? Trying to fit trying to be accepted, trying to actually work out who's who and what's what and who relates to who and which surnames go with which surnames. If it's not that, it's the pressure of being a fly-in, fly-out worker effectively. You've been brought here for a job and you want to fit, but you've got the pressure of work that's always calling you. We know the pressures, don't we? Everyone in this room fits into one of those three categories. We know the pressures of a small town. We know the pressures that these people in Ephesus faced because those were the pressures that were working on them as their walk had to change. And those pressures were all about habits. We've all got habits, don't we? Uh, I get up, I check the news, I read my Bible, I have two coffees, both triple shots, I have muesli with natural yogurts and berries, then I start the day. I'm so boring. We've all got habits though, don't we? The habits range from your breakfast to how you walk through life. Our habits are ingrained. They reflect who we are. They reflect our identity. But when your identity has been radically changed, then those habits will change. That walk will change. That's a tough change. It's a necessary change. But what happens when those new habits, that new walk, get under those pressures we talked about, what's the, what's the safest thing to do? It's to go back to the old walk because you're so comfortable in that, aren't you? It's the way we've always done things. Well, don't do it. Because let me tell you, Paul says in verses 17 to 19, what is that old work like? Look at verses 17 to 19 with me. Therefore I say this and testify in the Lord. You should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their thoughts. They're darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. They become callous, gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. The the key description is at the end of verse 17, the futility of their thoughts. Now, to my modern ears, that sounds a fairly harsh description of the way humans work mentally. I mean, when you think about it, we've conquered space. We've created things like antibiotics. And we've got machines that are able to recognise particular weeds in a paddock and just spray them. We've created 
nanorobots that can go into arteries. We go into art galleries and we are breathless at how beautiful creative people are. We sing songs that just sit in us. We're futile in our thoughts. That doesn't seem fair, does it? They're not futile thoughts, are they? And that might be true from our perspective. But think about this. If your mind is already futile, you wouldn't recognise that your mind is futile, would you? If your mind is already futile, you wouldn't recognise that your mind is futile, that it is already dark. But when you measure it against the design template and the bloke who designed it, what do you get? When you measure it against the God of the universe who speaks and things happen, when you measure what our minds create, you cannot avoid the conclusion that the life that we've created in this broken world is futile. Now, let me give you a, an example. It's a real example. There was once a horse feeder in a paddock. Uh, it was an old, early, vintage, valiant sedan. Uh, it was a good horse feeder, as far as horse feeders go. Uh, it held the hay and the horses could eat it. That's a good horse feeder, isn't it? And one day a friend of mine, a policeman, saw it, bought it and pulled it out of the paddock. He then spent five years restoring it, taking it back to what it was made for. Now, whilst it was a good horse feeder, it was an even better car, wasn't it? It had been restored to its original design and purpose. Its previous life as a horse feeder was a pale imitation of what it had been designed to be. It did a terrific job. It looked after this man and his family as they went through all their years, their teenage kids, before they even went to the mission field. Restored to what it was intended to, it was an even better car than a good horse feeder and it brilliantly did its job. When humans reject God, when humans say, I am God and God is not, then life does seem to go well, doesn't it? But when you measure it against the design, it's a pale imitation of what life can be, what it is meant to be. And it's ultimately futile because it's not what we were made for. And Paul wants to unpack that. Do you see there in verses 18 to 19, those three underlined words? They unpack the futility of their thoughts. It's life in the dark. When you reject the one who gives light, what do you get? You get darkness, don't you? In fact, you can live in the dark so often that you forget what light looks like. And that's the way our imagination works. Uh, it's life that's excluded from life. That's a strange thing. But again, if you reject the one who made life, what do you get? You get death. You get life excluded from life. You reject the purpose of life. There's an ignorance. And if you keep doing that long enough, what do you become in verse 19? You become like Bernard Gabbard's toes from too much running, calloused, hard. No feeling, no reality, just made hard. You see, once God is rejected, Paul wants to say, once you are God instead of God, life is broken. Life is not life as it was intended to be. But you cannot grasp this if you are God yourself, can you? If you're caught in that cycle if you've become so callous that you think you're God and God is not? How can you break out of that? Uh, well, we're actually told there in verse 20 and 21. That's the next point on the outline. But, but that, that is not how you learned about the Messiah, assuming you heard him and were taught by him because the truth is in Jesus. No one ever meets Jesus by making him up. Everyone meets Jesus when someone intervenes or something intervenes so that they actually come face to face with him. That's how that cycle is broken. The idea, the reality, the truth about Jesus Christ is spoken. 
In fact, you notice there that when that is spoken, you are taught by Jesus. When the message that a bloke who is God's son was born and was raised and lived a perfect life, who was never a rebel against God, who died on the cross for everyone who was, who was raised from the dead, and there is the evidence. When that is spoken to someone, they meet Jesus. And that darkness is broken. And they get to know what life is about. That's how the Ephesians came to this point. And what did it do to them? Well, like light does with darkness, it transformed them. They move from death to life, from hating God to being in God's household, from enemies of God to sitting down for dinner with God, from running a rival kingdom to being in God's household. And do you notice how that's unpacked in verses 22, 23, and 24? That's the double underlined words. This is what it looks like. You took off your former way of life. The old man, that's corrupted by deceitful desires. You're being renewed in the spirit of your minds. You put on the new man, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. That's what it means to meet Jesus. You put off your old person. When I used to work on prayer, my hands are too soft to do this now. I used to love landmarking. It was just a good physical day. You could see what you'd done. Do you think I'd ever be allowed into the house with the clothes I'd worn for landmarking? They stink. They have bits of lamb all over them. You can't bring those old clothes into this house. Your old walk has no place in God's household. Don't think you can rock up to the dinner table with God and walk to the dinner table that way. That old way needs to be taken off. It is not fit for the identity that God has already given you. In fact, you need to be changed in the way you think. Your minds need to be renewed. They need to be rewired so that they can actually look at the world from God's perspective, actually recognise a broken world, recognise a damaged world, and recognise that God has a design. And then you must put on the new man, the, the new way of life that reflects what God has already done, that reflects the new postcode, the new household, the new walk. Let me be very clear. None of those three things bring you in, do they? Did you hear what I said then? None of those three things make you part of God's mob. God's already done that. In Jesus, because he loved you, at the very moment you could do nothing for yourself. Instead, These three things reflect what God has given you. Your new identity, your new postcode, who you are and what God has already created in you. Now, be very clear about that, but also be very clear about this. These two ways of walking have nothing in common, do they? Verses 18 to 19, dark, excluded, callous, Verses 22, 23, 24, taken off, renewed, put on. They're two completely different ways of walking. They are starkly different. The Ephesians knew that. I wonder, do do we grasp how different these two ways of walking are? How different they are? How the same person cannot walk in two ways at the same time? What does that walk look like? Well, that's where verses 25 to 32 come. I'm not going to read them, but it's full of commands. Uh, uh, There's 11 of them there. That's the bold and the dot, dot, dot. I'm running out of underlines here, so I'm I'm improvising. Uh, That's the bold and the dot, dot. Speak, be angry, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down. Don't give. Must no longer steal. Must do honest work. Uh, work. No rotten talk should come from your mouth. Don't grieve. Must be removed from you. Be. That's the walk. That's the list of commands that make up the walk, and we'll unpack some of those over the next few weeks. Let me just make four observations as a way of finishing. 
And the first observation is this. I don't think they're complicated, are they? They're pretty simple commands. Don't sin. It's pretty simple. Don't steal. No rotten talk. Must be removed. B. I I don't think they're complex commands, are they? They're simple. But don't let that make you think they are easy. Uh, Let me just pick one. All bitterness must be removed from you. What's the enemy of every good gardener in terms of grass? It's cooch grass. Okay? Cooch grass. It is so hard to kill, isn't it? In fact, you think you've defeated it and there's this little thing under the ground. I don't even know what it is, but it pops up more cooch grass. Bitterness is like that. And we know what it is. We know how bad it is. We know how dangerous it is. And sometimes we're not even aware it's there. We know what it means to get rid of bitterness. Is that easy to do? No. Does that mean we shouldn't do it? No. They're clear commands. They're still tough. I think the second observation is this. All of them are relational. It's very hard to be angry without someone to be angry at, isn't it? Even if you're angry at something out there, it's connected with people. All of them are about community. They're all connected with relationship because that's what we are. We're a household. And this is talking about the way we relate. Notice that at the end of verse 25, because we are members of one another. This is our mob. These are lived in relationship, in community. Thirdly, they're all about habits. Let me, let me reassure you, habit is not a dirty word. A habit is a good thing. It's a very simple thing. It's just repetitive behaviour that shows who we are. That's all a habit is. Repetitive behaviour that shows who we are. They need to be worked on. They get ingrained and they are central to showing who we are. How do you work on those habits connected with those 11 commands? Well, here's the fourth observation. Uh, We're given a way of thinking about it. Uh, the men's breakfast, sorry, Ash, I didn't consult you, but I'm going to go, go through with it anyway. The men's breakfast yesterday was great. Uh, it was really terrific. Uh, and Ash made the comment, okay, Ash made the comment that he's reading through the Bible in how many years? 21 years, thanks, Gordo. 21 years. So don't complain about how long I preach, okay? Um, but 21 years. So he's, he's reading a chapter a, da- a week, listening to a few sermons on that chapter, and then reading some commentaries, and then the next week he goes through, isn't that terrific? That's really getting into the guts of it. So here's a suggestion. There are 11 commands. There are 12 months next year. That gives you a month up your sleeve. Why don't we pick a habit a month? You're already given a framework to think through. The framework's there in verses 22, 23, 24. You could think through each of those habits for a month, thinking, well, what was the old way of doing that? How do I renew my mind? I'm going to read every Bible reference to bitterness so my mind is renewed. And then what's the new person I'm putting on? Wouldn't that be a great way to think through our habits next year? I mean, you could start now and really stretch it out, couldn't you? A way to think through our habits with the word of God, which we've all got, in the way that God designed. And so our habits are changed. In any situation, it's easier to go back to your old way of walking, isn't it? Think about Tony Abbott. Much easier to go back to being in opposition when you're Prime Minister. You know how to do it. That's why when we start our fitness programs, they're so hard to do, aren't they? 5K run, packet of Tim Tams. I'll go to the Tim Tams. Old habits are hard to change. Old ways of walking are hard to change. But we're part of God's mob, aren't we? Let me remind you, therefore I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their thoughts. Let me pray.
Dear God, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for a man who was sitting in jail. Paul didn't waste words. Thank you that you've already made us your people. Thank you that our new walk doesn't make us your people, but shows we your people. Father, please help us to change our walk. Amen.